UV is vital to all vertebrates. Yes, I've said it. Once again, UV is vital to all living animals, including reptiles and amphibians. Now that's out of the way, let us start with the video. Hello and welcome back to Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. This video is part of our series Herptiles Explained and is all about the weirdly controversial relationship between herptiles and ultraviolet radiation, or UV for short. As many of you will know, we keep our animals outside, in spacious enclosures with access to sunlight, natural food and mental stimulation. And it really does show, our animals look stunning and they behave as naturally as possible. I can vouch for this personally, as we have watched and studied these animals many times in their natural environment. To understand the role of sunlight and UV radiation in all of this, we need to understand the biology and physiology of herptiles. So for that I'm going to hand over to Liam Sinclair of Reptiles and Research, who is firstly going to talk about the D3 cycle. Vitamin D3 precursors also known as 7-dehydrocholesterol, are naturally produced in the dermis and are converted into pre-vitamin D through conversion of UVB light, which is about 290 to 315 nanometers. When exposed to heat, the pre-vitamin D is converted into vitamin D3, which is carried in the blood plasma to the liver, where it's converted to the hormone calcidiol, also known as 25-hydroxyvitamin D3. It is then carried to the kidneys, where a part of it is converted into calcitriol, also known as 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D3, the active metabolite in the kidneys. 25-hydroxyvitamin D3, or 25-OHD3, is the most stable metabolite and also is at the highest levels in the blood plasma and serum, making it an excellent indicator of vitamin D status. What we describe as heat is but a section of the electromagnetic spectrum of light, from 700 nanometers all the way up to 1 millimeter. Within this, there is infrared A, which falls within the bracket of around 700 nanometers to 1400 nanometers, infrared B, which is within the bracket of 1400 nanometers to 3000 nanometers, and infrared C, which falls within the bracket of 3000 nanometers to 1 millimeter, all of which is produced by the sun at different quantities. These quantities are 32% infrared A, 14% infrared B, 2% infrared C, and the rest being made up of ultraviolet light and visible light. During the day, the sun produces these in these proportions. And even though the technology is progressing, we truly cannot replicate these exact parameters in our end type of area. A daily photo period is important for hormonal functions as well as identifying basking opportunities via the parietal eye. For instance, in this study, the ruined lizard's circadian rhythm of behavioural temperature selection was disrupted, even described as completely abolished, when the parietal eye was obstructed. And in this study, visible light is described as a primary stimulus for regulating basking and thermoregulation behaviour. The parietal eye can be thought as similar to the Lux reading app that used in this example. This section of the study is particularly interesting. It is apparent from the above investigations that the parietal eye has a direct effect on thermal selection, complementary to any function as a light dosimeter. If the theory of light dosimetry for the parietal eye relates to thermal selection in lizards, then increasing light intensity elicits greater parietal inhibition of basking. Lizards that had the parietal eye removed or blocked often overexpose themselves and experienced hypothermia. What this means is, is that light is just an, as an important indicator as when to move away from heat as it is to seek it. And as much as we try to increase visible light levels in our inside vivariums. It will never compare to the amount of visible light the animals would receive if kept outdoors with full exposure to the actual sun. The implications of this are huge. It means that UV is a genuine necessity if based on the Animal Welfare Act of 2006. That states that animals need a suitable environment and it needs to be able to exhibit normal behaviour patterns. And because light level is so intertwined with behaviour as Liam highlighted, could it be that potentially outdoor keeping could be seen as the next big step in herp husbandry? I don't know. However, indoors UV is provided via bulb and sometimes via oral ingestion, such as by dusting feeder insects, but this has problems as Liam is going to explain. Historically, good output 
of UVB was difficult, leading to synthetic vitamin D3 being orally supplemented in the diet, something that is still prevalent in the hobby today. This is problematic as the exact doses required per species, sex, life stage, season or per body weight may be unknown. Supplementation of synthetic vitamin D3 given in excess can be harmful to the animal, whereas excess production of 25-hydroxyvitamin D3 under UVB cannot occur and is self-regulating due to a buildup of a reversible pool of inert metabolites in the dermis. For this reason, exposure to UVB light is a safe alternative to dietary supplementation, as the risk of hypervitaminosis is rendered redundant. Outdoors, however, we have the real thing, the sun. Considering all vertebrates have lived under its rays for millions of years, they've evolved to make use of this totally free energy source. However, not all outdoor enclosures are created equally. So, what does this mean for us keepers wanting to keep our herps outdoors? Well, firstly orientation is key. Facing your vivarian north would be a bad decision, as you would get little to no sunlight and UV exposure. Therefore, southwards facing is key. Another very important point is that UV is filtered through, to some degree, by different materials. Glass blocks around all UVB and around 75% of UVA. Polycarbonate blocks almost all UV, bar maybe 1 or 2%. Now that I listed these materials is because these are commonplace in greenhouses, meaning that keeping herbs in greenhouses would not be suitable without adjustments. We recommend either removing paint entirely or replacing them with UV permitting acrylic, such as sunbed acrylic. On balance, we can see that UV radiation is needed for sound husbandry. So as advancing keepers, we should always follow and take on board the latest scientific research. Talking about research, please head to Liam's channel, Reptiles and Research, which promotes excellent husbandry through a science and evidence-based approach. The link to his wonderful channel will be in the description below, and I just want to thank him for helping with this video. And as always, from all of us to all of you, have a great day, and please stay tuned with Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.